Sing for joy in Yahweh, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming for the upright. The word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his covenant faithfulness to deliver their soul from death. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. O Lord, let your covenant faithfulness be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Let us invoke our God together. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in covenant love to all who call upon you. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. To a people who desire to bring honor and glory to their king and who do so with sincere hearts, hear them the greeting of your king. To you, loved by God and called to be saints, the conquerors who overcome the world and darkness and shall inherit the crown of life, grace and peace in the election of the Father by the blood of the Son and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let us confess that we are here because the Holy God, who is one in three, the Trinity, has delivered us from death to life. So let us profess our understanding as the scriptures have revealed them of the one true God summarized in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Not only is this a summary of our Trinitarian faith, but you see quite a bit of scripture summarized there so that we have a handy way of remembering these things. It is in that light, then let us now turn to Psalm 66. We will sing the first seven verses on page eight, all lands to God, and this is the will of the church. It is our desire that all the peoples of the earth shall come and worship the King of Kings. Let us sing now, all lands to God in joyful sound.
Please be seated. Psalm 66 affirms that the work of God is mighty, terrible, bringing terror upon those who are his enemies and even upon those who are his precious children. As we see his strength, his might, his power, it should cause us to really be mindful and respectful of all that he says, especially as we recognize we've sinned against him. So as we turn now to understand the law of God, let us consider that it is very disingenuous of us to say on the one hand that we want to admire the handiwork of God and to praise his name, and then to violate the very direct and simple, straightforward commands of God. But beloved, be assured, God is telling you these things in order to bring you to repentance, to restore you, in order that you would obtain the blessings through Jesus Christ. In the day you were delivered from the domain of darkness to everlasting life, there was great joy in the presence of God and his angels. And you have been called now to glorify God in all of life, knowing and doing his will. And you will know his will from his perfect and most precious law, where he says, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Beloved, what does the Tenth Commandment require? That not even the least inclination or thought against any commandment of God ever enter our heart, but that with our whole heart we continually hate all sin and take pleasure in all righteousness. Now, our summary here of the catechism of this Lord's commandment, uh, the Tenth Commandment, is not dealing with the technical parts of the commandment, you shall not covet, because these items are already covered earlier in the catechism when it says you shall not steal, it says you shall not be envious of the property of others, when it says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, we're told do not commit adultery, don't even allow lustful thoughts to enter your hearts. What's being said in this commandment, God wants us to know, he is not impressed with those who have an external conformity to the law if their heart's desire are not also being reflected in that. Because, as we have said, we want the world to recognize God is all-powerful. He delivered us even when the great enemy, Satan and death, were trying to accuse us and condemn us. And if we really do believe that God is that powerful and that gracious, then we must, as it says here, take pleasure in all righteousness and hate sin, that which has put God in the position, the things we have done whereby God had to take our flesh and die for our sins. And so this commandment says, all of our sin starts from the heart. It is our nature to desire things for ourselves now rather than actually believing God is a good and loving father, able to give us far more than we could imagine. The reason we do not have is that at this time, many things are not appropriate for us to have, not because God is stingy. And so the 10th commandment forces us to acknowledge we are a people whose sins are not just our outward actions, it reflects what is actually in our character, and we are called now to hate sin, always, everywhere, and actually find delight in the things that please God because we recognize that this is coming from a good and loving Father. Now we need to wrestle with what this means for us in our sinfulness because we have not viewed the law of God in this way. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, called to declare the excellencies of God's grace. So what is it that you have done and why and who has deceived you? Why have you fallen from your high station? God did everything well. He made you in his image, upright and holy. But you sinned against him and his law. And though God loved you so much, he did not spare his own son. 
you still could not believe that he would be graciously giving you all things. Now here's something else he gives you, this day of repentance. The Lord rebukes and reprimands you because he loves you. And if you will hear him now and repent, he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins. So beloved, will you acknowledge you are a sinner? The humbled sinner calls out, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous sway in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So you call to the Spirit of God to convict you or, or to uh, declare you innocent. Does this law absolve you, or does this law condemn you? It condemns me, because I have sinned and am without excuse. So then where is your hope to be found? God the Father predestined me. Jesus paid for my sins with his own blood, and the Holy Spirit regenerates me. In sum, now I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone. So how will you now live before God? I recognize my high calling, signed and sealed in my baptism, and will walk in newness of life, a slave to righteousness, under the sanctifying work of the Spirit, thankful to God for his blessings. Beloved, having the Spirit of God in us, he will more and more make us to hate sin and take pleasure in righteousness. So let us confess our sins before God and let us pray that he would continue to transform and sanctify us in truth. Our great and most holy God, how awesome are your ways. We come before you this day because you have granted that to sinners this day, the gospel would be proclaimed. And you would call those who are rebellious to forsake their foolish ways and return to you. And even among those who belong to you already, you remind us that we are not yet sanctified, that we are still living in grace, that you are upholding us, that we are not here because we have outdone others and have proved ourselves, but rather because you are patient and willing to forgive and you have chosen to love us and make us your children. Let us therefore marvel in your ways and truly be terrified when we, we consider if you were like us, we would already have been condemned. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would work in our hearts by your spirit a genuine revulsion against a true hatred for sin that we would stop being so stupid, that we would listen to the lies of the world about gaining immediate pleasure without fear of consequence. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to see contentment in you is a great blessing because you have made a world of abundance beyond what we could imagine. And these things are our inheritance. Help us to recognize that you do give us every good thing and you know our frame, and you prevent us from obtaining things before we are ready, and you are training us up in the way of righteousness and truth. So we pray that more and more we will recognize it is not our purpose to fool others with an external righteousness, telling them how wonderful we are, but it is for us to consider that as your children, we are to reflect your character, and we are to take pleasure in the righteousness revealed in the law, and to have that as our great treasure. Lord, we ask that we should also understand how we who have sinned have been made right with you, and this through the blood of Christ the Son. We ask, therefore, that we should marvel in your love and be truly thankful that you would love us so much that you would pay for our sins with your own death. May we, therefore, love you all the more, recognizing the cost of our deliverance and give you all the honor and praise that is due your name. Amen. Beloved, please stand that you would be assured through the word of God of the work of Christ. Beloved, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven and the record of your transgressions is blotted away and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ who will resurrect you in the last day. We are singing a song that is kind of unusual for us after our confession of sin, 
This is the, uh, based on Psalm 104, speaking of the creation of God and the abundance and the bounty of all that he has made, that we consider the stupidity and the foolishness of our coveting. Let us acknowledge that God is a God who grants us all things in great abundance, and let us continue to have confidence that he will give us every good thing. So we will respond by singing, of the great God who made earth and delivered us by his blood, O worship the king, page 10. seated. And so we affirm God's bountiful care is abundant and overflowing, and he is gracious and merciful to us. And he did not merely save us in order that we should obtain the blessing, but he has granted to us the incredible privilege that we would be instruments in his hand to bring this good news of the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. And so we get to do that in our worship as gathered together the saints of God. We are a light to the nations and we get to now add our prayers with the prayers of the saints and take them to the very throne of God. And there, as Christ said, like the persistent widow, continue pounding on the door of the judge and say, give us what we ask for. Lord, grant that the mission of the church would continue and the nations would be blessed. Let us pray. Our gracious God, We come before you this day because you drew us here. We are here entirely because you've given us your spirit and you've given to us a new nature. You've made us a new creation and you have made us to desire to be in your church with your people and to receive the good news of the gospel proclaimed and the sealing signs of the sacraments to testify to us of the reality of your great unfailing love for us, which was manifested in the work and in the bloody crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We ask, therefore, that as we come before you, we would come, our heads hung low, humbled by the knowledge of what it cost to you to make us your own, and yet absolutely confident and rejoicing and running towards you as young children do, 
so rejoicing in seeing their parents come home that we would have that confidence that you have loved us and every privilege of belonging to the family of God is ours because you have graciously given us all things. And so now we come to you as you've told us to do, to come to you and to say, give us what we ask for. Give to us the souls of our family members whom we love. Lord, do not allow them to remain in sin. Do not allow anyone who has refused to heed the call of the gospel to continue on in their stubbornness and their foolishness. Draw them back to yourself and regenerate them. We pray for husbands and wives. We pray for parents and for children. We pray for brothers and sisters. We demand of you, O Lord, hear us. Not because we are so arrogant, but because you've told us, be bold and ask. Lord, we desire to see your church filled with the people whom we have known and loved, the people who we live with, the people who are in our neighborhoods, the people who are in our schools and workplaces. It grieves us that we do not often have the courage to speak to them. So strengthen our faith. Give us to us a confidence and a boldness to ask of them, come and hear the word and be reconciled to God. So we pray for the ministry of this church that you will keep us pure, that you will prevent us from schisming, that you will prevent us from having fights grow out of proportion. Lord, if we cannot have peace among ourselves and there's no hope for the world, so grant that the world can see we have learned how to live at peace because your spirit is in us and we can forgive people who are imperfect and who have offended us. Lord, we ask that you would also cause the gospel to go forth and people would understand how we can forgive because we have first been forgiven and Christ died for us to make that possible. We pray for the church planting work in Ventura, and we ask that you will make that body of believers to be a shining light, and the pure word of the gospel will be preached from the pulpit there, and the word would go forth to their neighborhood also. We pray for the work of reformed faith and life in Armenia, and we ask, O oh God, that you would give a heart of repentance to the Armenian people, and they can be such a marvelous witness because they have enemies around who have sought to butcher and destroy that nation. If they can show the love of Christ, oh God, you can turn their enemies to be your own children. And it is difficult for the Armenians to imagine that they should bring blessings upon the Turks and the Azeris. But Lord, what a wonderful thing to show the power of Christ working in those people. So we pray for the work of Reformed Faith and Life to bring the pure word of the gospel to that land. We also ask that you should continue the work of the faithful churches around the world and that you should bring the work of the gospel to places that are still in darkness. We pray for South Africa, and we know that the Dutch Reformed Church has been present there. We are troubled that the witness was often corrupted, but Lord, you have also preserved for yourself faithful witnesses who have fought for the truth of the gospel to be proclaimed. And we ask that you would strengthen the faith of the believers, that you would purify the preaching in the churches, and you would cause a people who have hated one another to learn to forgive one another because Christ Jesus is both their lords. We ask that you should work in that land and bring some of the terrors of that land to a halt. We pray for Spain, and we know the Spanish peoples have bitterly opposed the pure preaching of the gospel, and they prevented reform preaching at the time of the Reformation and murdered many ministers and chased out many believers. We ask, despite this, that you show mercy to the Spanish people and to the people of the Iberian Peninsula, not because they are worthy, but because you are gracious, not because they deserve any good, but because it would be wonderful to see your power transforming an entire culture that had seethed against you. Turn back the hearts of a people to yourself, O oh Lord. We pray for Sri Lanka, and we know that the Sinhalese Buddhists hate everything Christian because it is considered foreign, and we know even the Hindus who live in that land are not happy with you. Lord, we are not asking for you to give them the pleasure of their hearts, but rather to glorify your name. And may the Hindus and the Buddhists of that land hear the gospel and be transformed. And may there be peace between these peoples as they are united in Christ Jesus. Pray for the small, far-off lands that seem isolated and alone where the people can believe that nobody will ever call them to account, certainly not God. But Lord, we ask that you should give to the people of St. Bartholomew and Helena and Kitts, Nevin, Lucia, Martin, Pierre, Miquillon, and Vincent, a knowledge that they are indeed image bearers of God 
and that they are able to minister and be a blessing and their prayers added to ours, calling that the world should hear the gospel. We ask, O oh Lord, that you should remind all believers everywhere they are never too small, too weak, too old, or too sick to continue to lift up their prayers before you, calling upon you to strengthen their faith and to take the gospel to the world. We remember our own needs and we pray that you will strengthen us as a body. We know our weaknesses. We know that you've chosen us. And so for your own namesake, we ask that you would strengthen our faith, unite us in love, and give to us a desire that we should have our image conform more to the image of our great God and Father who loved us and purchased us by the blood of the only begotten Son of God, so that we may now be able to call upon you as our God and Father as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us please stand now for the reading of the written word found on pages 4 and 5. And we are going to look at Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. But just before we get to that, just let me read from the beginning a little bit, and then we'll skip to 13, 7. The oracle of the word of Yahweh concerning Israel thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit within that man. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. Skipping to Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third to the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, Yahweh is my God. Turning to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep and the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas came up, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Verse 53. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures and the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, and it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And 1 Peter 1, 3-7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials." so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is refined by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So far the written word. Let us pray. Eternal Father, who has spoken in various times and in various ways to your people in the past, but in these last days in your Son, the incarnate word, We pray that you will open the mouth of your servant to proclaim that word in the power of the Spirit. And we pray that this same Spirit will open the hearts of its hearers here assembled to receive your holy gospel and write it on their their hearts, your holy law, even as you have promised. All this, O gracious Father, we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we come to the conclusion of the section of Zechariah starting at chapter 12 verse 1 and going to the end of chapter 13 where God seems to all of a sudden have lost decorum and now starts rushing to declare that he wants something done. So let's see what it is that God wants done because he says in Zechariah 13 7, awake O sword against my shepherd. So God is wanting the sword of judgment to go forth and to destroy his shepherd. What and why? What is going on here? Well, let's remember to whom Zechariah is ministering. He is ministering to Israel, to the descendants of Abraham. And what kind of people are they? Unfortunately, we recognize them. They are just like us. Who is Abraham? Abraham's an idolater. Remember at the time that Abraham lived, there was Melchizedek the king of righteousness in the city of Salem. He was the king of peace. He knew the true God. But Abraham was called out of pagan, blasphemous idolatry to come and serve God. And while he did obey, he left Ur of the Chaldeans and traveled all the way to Salem. Nonetheless, Abraham was, on the one hand, strong in his faith, enough to give up everything to move at a time where it was not easy like today, But then he still didn't trust God and lied about his relationship to Sarah so that Sarah got kidnapped and put into the harem of Pharaoh. And then he didn't trust that God would bless him with seed, so he slept with uh, his servant Hagar. Clearly, he's not a great and virtuous man, but he's an Israelite. And what about his son? Isaac raised up terrible sons. You know, and he's, again, of the line of the blessing. And then the one who is given the name Israel, Jacob, not a role model for any of us. He's a vile human being. These are the people who are being ministered to by the prophets. They are, in fact, prophets themselves who are being given the word of the knowledge of God is redeeming for himself a people. And we can see very clearly, not the kind of people we would think are choice, but it's the ones whom he has chosen to love. That's what makes them choice. And the story doesn't end with them. Moses doesn't keep the covenantal signs. He's almost killed. His wife Zipporah has to circumcise his sons. Ultimately, Moses can't even enter the promised land. And then after him, you know, even a priest like Eli doesn't do a great job. He's worthless. His sons die having committed all sorts of sins in the temple of God. And Samuel, who is a great man, his sons are so worthless, the people say, we would rather have a tyrannous king than any of Samuel's sons rule over us, and it doesn't improve. So, it is to such a people that God has sent Zechariah and tells them, I am building for myself a great temple, and I'm providing for myself a holy priest, and I'm going to make you to be a great nation, and I'm going to cause you to take the light of the gospel to the world. Well, how is God going to do this with such worthless people? like them and like you and me. How is it that God can promise any good? Well, we already saw. God rules over all. And he knows exactly the kind of people he is working with. He knows who we are. And so in the visions that Zechariah was given to give to the Israelites, he was meant to tell them 
not by your might, but by my might. You may, in your arrogance, think this is the day of small things. You fail to recognize my glory is dwelling in your midst, and my glory will cause the ends I have purposed. And so we see here in Zechariah 12, 1 through 13, uh, 6, the selections we have taken. I want you to note, I'm going to emphasize every time the words on that day are being said. So here's what God is telling Zechariah to tell the people after they've had all the visions. So the oracle, the prophecy of the Yahweh, the one true covenantal God concerning Israel, this is what the Lord declares. He who created, who stretched out the heavens, founded the earth, and formed man and put the spirit within man. On that day, what day? My day. On that day, I will make Jerusalem, right now despised, weak, and forsaken, I will make Jerusalem to be an overwhelming, heavy stone when every nation even comes against it. On that day, declares the Lord, again, on that day, I will strike every horse of the enemy nations and I will make all their riders be mad, go insane. Verse 6, on that day, I will make, on the other hand, the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like flaming torch among sheaves, and they shall devour, burning up the right and to the left, all the surrounding peoples, while Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the weakest, feeblest among them on that day shall be like mighty David who conquered Goliath and then destroyed all the enemy nations. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of Yahweh who went before them and defeated the Egyptians and then defeated all of the Canaanites and destroyed the walls of Jericho. On that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, all those who hate my people. So God is promising on that day, I'm going to make Jerusalem to be an overwhelming force that no nation can come against. And when they do, I will confuse and destroy them. On that day, I shall bring blessings and life and make even the weakest of my people to be mighty as David and I will pour out. So it's still on that day, I'll let say it right there. But I will now pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. That should probably have been capital, the Holy Spirit of grace. And please for mercy. When the Spirit is given to us, we recognize our sins. We call upon God for forgiveness. So that when we look upon God himself in Christ, on whom we have pierced, we shall recognize the horrors of what we have done, have sorrow, mourning for him as one mourns for an only child. We weep bitterly over what our sins have done to him as one weeps over a firstborn. And so on that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be great, horribly great, as there was sorrows when the last good king of Israel was killed, mourning at Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. And on that day, when we sorrow, over the sin of piercing God himself. There's no question that, 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 I, that it's the piercing is of God. Then God will, on that day, open up a fountain on the house of David, on the house of Jerusalem, in order to cleanse them for, because of their sin and uncleannesses. On that day, declares Yahweh of the armies of heaven, I will actually cut off all the false idols and their names from the land so that they have no chance of corrupting my church any longer. On that day, every prophet, the false eyes, will be ashamed of their visions and their prophecy, recognizing that they are in fact descendants of Adam, sold into sin and death, not able to discover good, but rather it must be revealed to them by God, and they confess their wounds are appropriate, the suffering that we have. And now in that light, we come to 13.7. God having prophesied on that day, I will come back to Jerusalem and I will destroy the nations, I will bless them. Now God loses all composure. He cannot wait for that day. Even though that day means God has to take on flesh and die for our sins. And so I get this outburst from God. 
He loves you so much, knowing that he has to be pierced and die the sinner's death for you, he starts screaming out to the sword of judgment, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against my peer. That's what it means, the man who stands next to me. Who stands next to the king? Only the royalty. Awake, O sword, come and judge quickly. Strike the shepherd and begin this work. I want the blessings on my people. Beloved, sometimes it's difficult for us to recognize the passion, the amount of emotion, the love that went into our deliverance because there is certainly the legal aspect of it. We speak of forensic, legal justification, of debts having been accumulated, of the debts being transferred to Jesus Christ, Jesus paying for them, all of which we have to recognize. But don't lose sight of the passion of God, the intensity with which he loved you. This wasn't a group of noble Englishmen sitting around with that stiff upper lip contemplating how they were going to, you know, gain empire or something like that. This is much more the, think of like the over-emotional Mediterranean blood types screaming in passion as they are celebrating something and knowing the cost, still wanting it, crying out, awake, O sword! Strike my shepherd, strike me, because it is I who will be pierced. Strike and destroy and let my people be delivered. But in that day, my people are going to also have to recognize what it means to be my people in the midst of a sinful world. Because remember, we've already seen the visions of the pollutions of Jerusalem needing to be removed to Babylon. But the people are living in Babylon, in the spirit of Babylon. And so of those who are now going to be delivered, there's going to be suffering for them. Sadly, it still implies the majority of his people will be accursed. Because when they are scattered and the little ones are spread apart, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish. One third shall be left alive. So God has kept for himself a people. But of this third that is kept alive for life, they will be put into the fire, refined as one refined silver, tested and purified as gold is. And when they have undergone this time of trial and testing, then they will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, I will make a declaration before the world, they are my people. And the people will respond and say, Yahweh is my God. And God passionately desires this to occur. Now, some of you may have heard of recent theologians and their arrogance speaking of Christianity traditionally understood as simple child abuse. The father crucifies the son. That would be true if the father and the son were entirely different in essence, but they are not. They are of one essence, three in person, So when God is saying, strike my shepherd, it's not God the Father saying, strike the Son only. It is the Godhead, the person of the Father, speaking of the person of the Son, but it is God who will go and suffer. So we have to recognize this is God calling on himself the curses. And so Christ, who is God, willingly taking this work. And you see that, John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd is recognized by his willingness to lay down his life for the sheep. And the father loves me because I lay down my life for the sheep. Please understand, no one is going to take my life from me. Even the father is not taking my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, willfully, because I have this passion and I love you in this way. I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to take it out again, up again. And I have received a charge to do this from my Father. Colossians 1. All the fullness of God dwelt in Christ. Therefore, God calls this curse of the sword upon himself. But it was through Jesus Christ he willed to reconcile to himself all things on earth and in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And Jesus says to his disciples, Go back and read Zechariah because Zechariah spoke of me. Because you see in Matthew 26, Jesus says, when God declared through the prophet Zechariah, awake, O sword, against my shepherd and strike him down, Jesus, after they had had that first Lord's Supper and had sung a hymn, went out to the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to them, 
All of you are going to fall away because of me this night. Because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the flock will be scattered. Jesus says, I called this sword against myself and I wanted this sword to come against me. I wanted to die the sinner's death blasphemed because I loved you. Because on that day, only on that day, could deliverance come. And therefore, it must happen. And there will be a cost for you too. You will be scattered, but you will be gathered again because when I am raised up, I'll go before you into Galilee and you will come. And then you can see the rest of the narrative there. He is arrested by that group that is brought over there by Judas at the command of the high priests and the Pharisees and the disciples left him and fled. Hebrews 10. Consequently, when the anointed, when the Messiah came into the world, he declared this, that the entire Old Testament system of sacrifices, the Aaronic priesthood and the temple, sacrificing and offerings you have not desired. Rather, you've prepared a body for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. But I do this, taking on the flesh, your will, O God, as it is written in the scroll of the book. When Jesus said, you have neither desired, or actually when the psalmist said the words of Christ, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, Note the parenthetical comment. All of which were exactly what God commanded to be done. After he said, but you really don't desire these things, he added, here's what you do desire, that I have come to do your will. Indicating that all these things of the Old Testament sacrificial system were not what God really wanted. What God really wanted was the sword to be brought against him. And when he did that, he was able to put to death. He was able to end the old system. The first order is done away with. A second order is established because what God wanted to do was our deliverance. But it was necessary to establish the foundation, to have the shadows to teach us these things. And that's why you see in Matthew 26, where Jesus says twice, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, all according to the will of God. And once this is done, continuing on with Zechariah 13, verse 9, the third that is being saved and kept alive is going to be refined through the fire and tested. And then we will recognize the great gift we have received. And that's what the apostle Peter says. We bless our God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ because of great mercy he caused us to become a new creation, born again to a living hope. This by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ, obtaining an inheritance that can never be taken away, guarded and preserved by the power of God through faith. Verse 6, and we rejoice in this revelation, although now for a little while a sheep that are still somewhat scattered. We are going to be grieved by various trials in order that our faith will be tested and its genuineness proven so that it may result to the praise of the glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So why is it when we have such a loving and merciful God who demands the sword of justice, crucify him for our own sake, why do we still suffer? because we are being trained up and tested and purified so that the day will come that we have the absolute confidence in the midst of any trial to be able to say, God is my God, because we believe the testimony when God says, you are my people. So now the prophet Zechariah had all those dreams and visions for several chapters and all the mystical things that go with it. We saw it was actually a pretty straightforward interpretation. Why did God reveal all these things? In order that we, no better than Abraham, no better than Jacob, that we would recognize that God has chosen us and he will bring about this work he has promised and our blessed inheritance, not by waiting on us to finally become a people worthy of blessing, but by he himself rushing in and demanding that the sword of justice 
come down upon him so that he would die in our place. And so you have God demanding, awake, O sword of judgment against my shepherd, who is me, who willingly, with full authority, lays down my life for the sheep. And though my sheep for a little while will be scattered, in this time of trial and tribulation, they are being purified. So, yes, our faith is not strong enough to endure every tribulation that comes which is why we have the Spirit of God. And there are many problems we are going to face, and you have to understand those are real trials. Don't minimize them. Don't compare your trials to another person and say, well, here's his worst, I guess I can live with mine. No, mine is horrible, whatever it is compared to others. But it is the work given to me. And what am I to do with it? In the midst of it, I am to have the confidence to declare, Yahweh is my God, who loves me so much that he demanded the opportunity to be the shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, having heard the prophecy of the deliverance of his people, of, of my deliverance, and knowing the cost, he could not wait. He demanded, because his love was so great, awake, O sword, and strike me to deliver my little ones. So, let us be confident that there was no cosmic child abuse. Jesus Christ knew the cost. He willingly did it. He is God. He prophesied all these things against himself. Why? Because he chose to love you. And don't look for something in yourself that makes you lovable. You're lovable because God loves you. And what an amazing thing that is to consider. So you see the centrality of the cross the call to love, what it all means. It's not simple sentiment. It is a heartfelt passion to act on the behalf of another and to bless them. And this is what God has willed. And this is what Zechariah the prophet was telling those Israelites of old who knew their fathers, who knew the sins of their whole nation, who knew from what worthless stock they had descended. They were told they needed to know this. God passionately desired to deliver them at the cost of his own blood. And he did it. So, beloved, now that we live in the age of fulfillment, let us be absolutely overwhelmed with thankfulness and desire to live with gratitude and recognize our trials and tribulations are for a little while to train us up and prove the genuineness of our faith as we persevere and let us therefore be there to encourage others who are weak around us and encourage them to continue to bring glory to such a great God who has loved us and saved us by his blood. Let's pray. O oh God, our God, may we know you more fully and understand you. It is difficult to imagine that such things are true, that the eternal God who had perfect contentment in himself as the Holy Trinity before time made us and loved us so much that you would passionately demand your own destruction for our deliverance. Lord, we can barely find the desire to do things for those whom we love. How much more for those who are our enemies? We ask, therefore, that we will recognize the wondrous prophecies of an everlasting inheritance in a great city. Do not come to those who have done well, but to those who had a God who loved them so much that he would rush to the cross and die for them and spill his blood, accursed by us. May we, therefore, learn to be ever more thankful and ever more grateful, ever more patient with those who we consider our enemies. Lord God, may we understand the kind of God we serve and the kind of men and women we are to become because we are to have the mind of Christ our Savior. So Lord, we thank you that the day of judgment has come upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you are withholding the day of judgment for a little while upon this world and while it is still today, it is the day to call the people to repentance. May we therefore reach out and tell a people of the love that God has of calling them to forsake sin and to cling to Christ Jesus, who lovingly, willingly, and with divine authority to call all the angels of heaven to his defense, laid down his life for the little ones, for the sheep. So we thank you, O God, for this gospel hope given to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 
Well, beloved, we will continue singing Psalm 66. It is a different tune, however, than the initial portion that we sang. This is verses 8 through 20. And here you see, especially in verses 8 and 10, the idea is taken of the peoples who are called to be the people of God are also called to go through a time of trial and yet in this to be purified and confident that God will hear our voice and pour out every blessing upon us. So let's continue singing Psalm 66 verses 7 through uh, verses 8 through 20. Please be seated. As we now come to the Lord's Supper, the Lord God would have us to know that indeed he wants us to remember his willingness to die for us so that we would never doubt his love to unglorified men and women, to sinners. And so we do not come here kind of with a confidence. We've done well this week. We deserve it. We've earned the table. We are to come to this table hearing in our minds God's desire to purchase us recognizing that this desire was because he chose to love sinners. So we are coming acknowledging it took the sword striking the shepherd, the man who stands next to the Lord of hosts, so that we would be delivered. And so it is an expression of our humility, of our need for grace, and our living in Christ's blood. Beloved, as we come to the table of the Lord, then please understand that if you are unwilling to publicly profess faith, or if you have not yet professed faith, please do not come to the table because it is for those who are willing to be identified with Christ and his people in all the world. And so if you have not obtained the permission of our elders, if you are not a member of a confessional Presbyterian Reformed Church, we ask you this day, please abstain. You probably haven't had all the teachings. We'd love for you to participate. We don't want to exclude anyone, but we also don't want to give a false confidence or put a curse on anyone's head. And so please, at this time, uh, if you don't understand the policy, please respect it, and we will be more than happy to give you the understanding of these things. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of profaning, despising the body and the blood of the Lord. When our Lord said, do this in remembrance of me, he ordained this holy supper as a constant memorial and visible proclamation of a sacrificial death. As we partake of the communion supper, therefore, we are bearing witness that our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father into the world, that he took upon himself our flesh and blood, and that he bore the wrath of God on the cross for us. We also confess that he endured the suffering and death of the cross, that we might live through him, and that he was once forsaken and accursed by God, that we should forever be accepted by him. So the sacrament is confirming us in God's abiding love and covenant faithfulness. Our Lord promises, moreover, that as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are fed with his crucified body and shed blood. To this end, he gives us his life-giving spirit, through whom the body and blood of our Lord become life-giving nourishment of our souls. Thus he unites us with himself, and so he imparts the precious benefits of a sacrifice to all who are partakers by a true and living faith. The Holy Sacrament is also a means of grace that unites us with one another in the bond of the Spirit. For the Apostle says that we who are many are one body, because we are all partakers of the one bread. Thus, even as he is uniting us with himself, he is also strengthening the bond between you and me, his precious children. Finally, the remembrance of our Lord's death revives in us the hope of his return. Since he commanded us to do this until he comes, the Lord assures us he will come again to take us to himself. So as we commune with him now under the veil of these earthly elements, we are assured we shall sometime behold him face to face and we shall rejoice in the glory of his appearing. To celebrate the supper of the Lord properly, it is necessary that we examine ourselves as we have been directed. So consider your estate. If you are left to yourself in your sins and accursedness, so that you may hate yourself and humble yourself before God, knowing that God really should have punished you in his divine wrath. But don't stop. Also examine your hearts. Whether you believe the sure promise of God that every one of your sins is forgiven you, but only for the sake of the passion and death of Christ, and that the complete righteousness of Christ is imputed and freely given to you as your very own, so completely that as if you yourself hath satisfied God's wrath for all your sins and fulfilled all righteousness. Now to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and evermore. Amen. Our God, we pray that you will draw us to yourself with deep humility and with a desire to marvel that you would give to us the sealing sign testifying you went to the cross, willingly laying down your life for us, and you are testifying of the reality of our being participants through the work of the Spirit in that sacrificial death so that our sins would be canceled, and now of the resurrection life and the power to fight sin and to bring glory to your name. Strengthen our faith by the means of grace you have appointed in order that your name would be exalted and glorified in all the earth. Amen. Beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. Please come and receive the elements and return to your seats and we shall partake together. I cannot give you up. I cannot surrender you. I cannot make you like the old cities of destruction or treat you like my enemies. My heart turns over within me. My compassions are kindled. I will not execute fierce anger against you and I will not destroy you again because I am God and not a man. The Holy One in your midst, I will not come to you in wrath. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food. 
My blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I abide in him. I am the true shepherd, and I came that you might have life and have it to the full. I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes my life from me. I have authority to lay it down and to take it up again. Christ is the before all things. In Christ Jesus, all things hold together. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of deity to dwell in Christ Jesus and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, on them the light will shine. Because to us a child will be born and a son will be given to us. And the government of the kingdom will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. When Jesus told his disciples that this is my body, he understood what it meant. He was calling that sword of judgment, but he wanted us to remember the love of God and his desire for our redemption. And so on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body against whom the sword of judgment has come. And so have confidence, I will love you. So return to me and be forgiven. Beloved, take, eat, remember, and believe Christ's body broken for you. That same night, Jesus also took the cup and declared, this cup is the new covenant. It is that which God willed for your benefit. So beloved, take, drink, remember, and believe the blood of Christ shed to wash away your sins. Let's pray. Almighty God, Forgive us, O Lord, that we have come in such a proud and unworthy manner into your house. We have cared little for those who are perishing around us. We have, in fact, had contempt for those who believe to be less righteous, less worthy than ourselves. We have come believing ourselves to be worthy of receiving the blessings of God when indeed we are humbled and polluted. We ask now, O Lord, that we would understand it took your death our sins were so horrible that only your dying in our place would give us hope. And yet that is what you desired to do, what you came to do. It was your plan from all eternity to love and purchase us, having the sword of judgment strike you. As we partake of the supper, therefore, let us acknowledge that this was a costly deliverance for us, but it is indeed really and truly our own, and we are now your children. So we pray that by your spirit, you will not only strengthen our faith and give us assurance of our justification, but you would give to us a passionate desire to grow in holiness, loving what you have revealed about righteousness and desiring to be conformed more to your image. And this just because it pleases you. We ask that you will do this and bring blessings upon the people around us as they see your power in our lives. So please, O oh God, use these sacraments to do the work that you've promised to do for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we have the great privilege of being servants of God, our King, and even our offering should never be seen as a token, but rather as a response of joyful gratitude and a participation in evangelism and in missions, and I hope that we give our offerings with that disposition. Let us then stand and sing a concluding doxology of praise to our God. You'll be able to give your offerings as you exit.
Beloved, be assured, God did not simply do a once-for-all work and then forget about us, but rather that once-for-all work continues to be applied. And in the benediction, you hear that God would have you to more and more be conformed to his glorious image that you would be pleasing in his sight. And now may the God of peace, who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, and this by the blood of the eternal covenant, now equip you in every good thing that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom then will be the glory forever and evermore. Grace be with you all. Amen.